In this presentation, I will provide an introduction to the very basic but essential elements of the hesychastic system of practices. All of these terms, concepts, and practices will have to be explained in much greater detail as we go. These are only first approximations, to get us all on the same page, as it were. In addition to the basic elements of, Hes of the hesychastic system, I will also introduce some of the most important interpretive concepts that we, we will be using to understand the dynamics of spiritual progress. These are the key ideas to carry forward that you will see on several pages of the presentation. In the words of the translators of the Philokalia into English, the Philokalia and hesychasm is an itinerary or map that we can follow in order to recognize the presence of God in everything we do, think, feel, and say. Thus, it provides a map, and this map itself produces within us the conditions of its own fulfillment. That is, the study of the map, of the hesychastic practices, of the spiritual texts, is itself the journey that the map describes. This is what hesychasm has to offer, and that this course of studies will, with God's grace, undertake to illuminate. You might consider this presentation a kind of key to some of the significant signposts of the hesychastic and philokalic maps. The term hesychasm comes from the Greek word hesychia, which connotes tranquility or silence. Hesychasm is usually used to connote the main form of spiritual practice found within the Eastern Orthodox churches, a very broad usage. However, we should be aware that scholars on hesychasm often employ the term in different ways, and they often engage the term controversially. Hesychasm can be narrowed to refer to the monastic movement of the 14th century, in which the dominant figure was St. Gregory Palamas. Related to this context, the term might be used to refer to the specific ways in which this movement was not limited to spirituality, but was a socio-political movement. For a brief summary of the hesychastic controversy of the 14th century involving St. Gregory Palamas, see pages 247 to 249 of Bingaman and Nassif's collection of essays called The Philokalia, a Classic Text of Orthodox Spirituality. If you would like to research this area further, let me know and I can provide you with many more references. Hesychasm also has a complicated history in modern times, being adopted or rejected in, or, in order to advance one definition or other of orthodoxy and to support a given socio-political identity. For our purposes, it's best not to let these tangential controversies distract us, though we should be aware that they exist. For our purposes, hesychasm connotes a system, that is, an integrated and organized body of beliefs and practices for the transformation of nature. The core of the hesychastic canon of texts is the Philokalia, a compendium, a compendium of texts produced in the 18th century on Mount Athos by Saints Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain and Macarius of Corinth. The Greek and Russian editions are commonly five volumes. To date, the English version is only four volumes, and the fifth volume is now very long awaited. We will be using the English edition published by Faber and Faber, though we will complement that with the excellent translations of Constantine Kavarnos in his two volumes of excerpts from the Philokalia. The title has various meanings. Literally, philos is Greek for love, and kalos is Greek for beauty, so love of beauty. But Philokalia might only have the more pedestrian meaning anthology. I suppose we should not be surprised that the very title of the major collection of texts of hesychasm should itself be multivalent. For more information on the meaning of the word philokalia, see Bingaman and, Bingaman and Nassif, pages 109 to 110 and 191 to 195. Omitted from the picture is a very good collection of hesychastic texts called The Art of Prayer, an Orthodox Anthology compiled by Igumen Sheraton of Valamo Monastery and translated by Kadlubovsky and Palmer. The majority of these texts come from St. Theophon the Recluse, but it also includes texts from St. Ignatius Brian Chaninov, St. Dmitri of Brostov, and many others. Hesychasm is a very rich tradition, and as such, the corpus of texts is very expansive. 
For the time being, if you do not already have some of these texts, you might consider beginning to collect them. There are various versions of the stories of the Desert Fathers and Mothers, the early ascetics of the Egyptian and Syrian deserts. Helen Waddell's alphabetical collection is probably the most widely cited. The Dionysian corpus, that is, the collected works of St. Dionysius the Areopagite, in scholarly works referred to as Pseudo-Dionysius or pseudo Denis, is the basis for the via negativa in Christian theology, known as apophatic theology, apophaticism, or negative theology. We will get into the details of apophatic theology later, but for now I will point out that it is somewhat unusual to be considering it in the context of hesychasm. In doing so, I believe that I am just following the monastic reading of the Dionysian corpus provided by Bishop Galitzin. As we get into the hesychastic texts, we will again and again run into passages, images, concepts, and even writing techniques that are rooted in Greek culture and education, or paideia. Many of these form a kind of common vocabulary and conceptual regime that is shared by everyone suitably educated and enculturated in Greek culture. In order to read hesychastic texts well, we need to be on the alert for evidence of these background assumptions. In addition, we will explore the major philosophers and philosophies that influence hesychasm. This study will reveal, at the philosophical level, how hesychasm integrates a Christian cosmology, that is, a theory or explanation of everything, an anthropology, that is, a theory or explanation of human nature, and the ethical and spiritual practices which produce the kinds of persons that belong within this kind of cosmos. For example, Commandments are not only legalistic prescriptions, but are nothing less than the modalities of God's existence in the world. This is the source of the multivalent nature of religious symbols, beliefs, and practices, a factor that I will explain shortly. Next week, we will examine the Greek philosophical roots of hesychasm, which are also the roots of Jewish Merkaba mysticism and its successor Kabbalah. While we don't have time to get into the Jewish and Sufi influences on hesychasm, if you want more infor information, see the rather old but still wonderful website of Archbishop Galitzin and Andre Orlov called The Jewish Roots of Eastern Christian Mysticism, as well as various articles by each of these authors. The hesychastic writers all assume a basically platonic picture of human nature. We will have frequent reference to three versions of this picture, the tripartite self, the dipartite self, and the tripartite faculties of the self. All of these images emphasize different aspects of the self, but we can generally note a common structure. Our nature is composite, and each of its composite powers is independent of the direct control of any of the other powers. We are disorganized, we are ignorant, and we are out of control. This description of human nature assumes a cosmology arranged in levels of being, in which spirit is the highest kind of being and matter is the lowest, a world largely described by Plato's revision of the Parmenidean worldview, all of which we'll get to later. Pythagoras gets the credit for the tripartite, tripartite anthropology, according to which human nature comprises three hierarchically arranged components, body, soul, and spirit. Of course, Plato utilized the tripartite self and its companion, the tripartite faculties of the self, to advance his program of universal reform. The most common form of the tripartite in philokalic literature is the tripartite of faculties. See the next slide. Here, the question might arise as to whether the different versions of a doctrine like the tripartite self indicates a lack of consistency among the hesychastic writers, or perhaps within hesychasm itself. The answer to this worry is that, in the first place, as Pierre Hadot said of the Hellenistic philosophers, consistency is subordinated to existential efficacy. That is, the teachings of hesychasm derive from experience, from an attempt to define the structure of an experience, an existence, that is rooted in that which is beyond being, Hooper Usius. Therefore, rational consistency was not a primary goal of the hesychasts. However, their attempts to describe spiritual life, to discern its laws of progression, and to map its common features display a surprising consistency. 
Therefore, when we think we have found a point of inconsistency, this should sound an alert not only for our critical spirit, but also for our devotional spirit. More often than not, the appearance of inconsistency results from the multivalence of symbols. Take the stages of spiritual progress on slide 11, for example, or Plato's cave allegory. Each of these symbolic systems describes spiritual progress as a linear series of stages and thereby suggest that spiritual progress is itself linear. In fact, spiritually, we are, uh, we are all at all points on the map. The tripartite self offers another example of this multivalence. While this anthropology suggests that the noose is our highest nature, the divine within us, knowing this does not mean that we are not also living at the levels of soul and body. We will be seeing many examples of such multivalence throughout the hesychastic system. We will examine in close detail the different faculties, their virtues and vices, early in the course. Ask yourself, if you were going to examine and describe your way of thinking, your awareness of yourself, the relationships between your feelings, thoughts, and impulses, how would you go about it? What model would you come up with? As with other elements of hesychasm, when we are analyzing the hesychastic understanding of the self, our purpose is not merely to achieve theoretical clarity, but to, but to gain clarity about our own self, our own nature. Therefore, it is important to notice even subtle differences in the different anthropologies that we find in spiritual and philosophical texts. Of course, Freud gives us another important tripartite, in which we are id, ego, and superego, and an indefinable unconscious. As we study the hesychastic anthropology, we will keep Freud's and other anthropologies in mind and make comparisons and contrasts between them, always with an eye toward our own transformation. The image of the two paths is a traditional one that is critically important to our spiritual progress. It helps us to make sense of certain emphases in the spiritual texts, and it helps us also to maintain balance in our own spiritual lives between physical, emotional, moral, and mental processes. Balance is itself a traditional metaphor in this context, though I don't really like it. I will instead typically refer to reciprocal transformation, or transformativity. This is an important but complex concept in my theory of practice, which, will, which I will explain in a later presentation. For now, it is important to note that the paths of knowledge and morality are two different but related paths, and that how they relate is complex and important. The disorder of the human self implies that there is a more orderly way of being. Hesychasm provides a program of exercises, beliefs, symbols, and practices that produce transformations in human nature, reordering it according to its original form in the image and likeness of God. Spiritual progress is usually described in terms of three stages, purification, illumination, and perfection. Other stages are found in the non-Greek Christian philosophers and in other traditions. We will study these stages in great detail throughout the course. Here and on the next slide, you have an outline of the hesychastic practices based on the three-stage model of spiritual progress, purification, illumination, or enlightenment, and perfection, or theosis. Theosis may be defined as deification, divinization, or the restoration of the image of God. In this context, we will examine the hesychastic teaching on the image and likeness of God. Each of the practices outlined here is complex and requires unpacking, again, not just for the sake of theory, but for the sake of aiding our own spiritual discernment and practice. Here I would like to point, out, to, point to the paradoxical practices of enlightenment. On the one hand, enlightenment connotes the development of the knowledge of the knowledge path, culminating in the perception of created essences or causes. On the other hand, enlightenment goes beyond or through these essences to the divine reality behind or within them. As a result, enlightenment marks a transcendence of created conditions, resulting in strange powers like the charismata or spiritual gifts. 
You might also note that I have integrated the elements of apophatic or negative theology into this outline of hesychastic practices. Apophatic theology, I will argue, cannot be properly practiced if it is divorced from the purificatory and enlightenment practices. Hesychasm also employs the whole range of Christian devotional and meditative practices. If you do not have a prayer rope, it would be a good idea to get one and to begin practicing the Jesus Prayer. As always, discuss any practices you wish to undertake with your spiritual director. By no means should anyone attempt any of the practices mentioned in the Philokalia without much study and deliberation. These practices are monastic practices, meaning that they are undertaken by monks who are living a way of life that supports them in their practice. If you, like me, are living in the world with family, job, and other obligations, these practices must be adjusted to fit our lives. Yes, the pilgrim in the famous Russian devotional work, The Way of a Pilgrim, says thousands of Jesus prayers a day, because he's not doing anything else. If you do not have a spiritual director then, as the hesychastics, uh, as the hesychists themselves tell us, you can use your study of the Philokalia and other spiritual texts in their place, but this is a very dangerous and difficult undertaking. In fact, when talking about practices like enlightenment, I always tell my students, be careful what you wish for. I point out that, in spiritual practice and progress, it is impossible to know what you're signing up for. At the beginning of the path of perfection, or even midway along that path, we simply cannot know what theosis will be like, and our models of what it will be like tend to form obstacles on the path. Perhaps you are already aware of the great joys, the gifts, the bells and whistles of spiritual progress. But then you are also aware of its ridiculous tedium, its painful barrenness, its sloughs of despond. The bad news is that these are unavoidable. The good news is that they, too, are part of spiritual progress. And though we feel at these times that we are stuck, in fact, we are always moving. As St. Gregory of Nyssa says, there's only two directions in spiritual life, forward or back. There's no standing still.